Hey, welcome to the Basketball Podcast. Today, I'm so excited to have Stan Van Gundy with us. And Coach Van Gundy has been a collegiate head coach, an NBA head coach with the Miami Heat, Orlando Magic, Detroit Pistons, and has won over 523 games at the NBA level. And Coach, we won't get too much into the bio because I just want to make sure that we use you as a great resource for coaches to learn and get a little bit geeked out on technical, tactical stuff. So thanks for joining us. Okay, glad to be here. Awesome. And coach, I'm so grateful that I got an opportunity to be able to watch your team's practice. And, you know, over the last three, four years, as I got a chance to take a sabbatical from coaching and travel the world and probably watched over 100 practices at different levels of pro, NBA, NCAA, international practices and stuff. And I have to say that your practice aligned very closely with what I would call an ideal practice in the sense that you balanced game based play with skill development and tons of technical tactical feedback as the game based as the game based philosophy or you know learn by playing always been a part of your practice philosophy i would say that it evolved there to be honest coach i think early on probably like a lot of us i probably leaned heavier on drill type work breakdown type work which is important but i think i did that at the expense of 5 on 5 type work so as time went on I evolved. And then the NBA, because we play so many games, you're playing four times a week. The biggest problem you have as a coach is finding the right balance between work and rest. I think that's always a problem. Whereas in college, I mean, you you would get four practices in a week and probably get a good two hours in every practice, even later in the year, maybe an hour and a half. In the NBA, it's a lot harder to put that kind of time in and then expect guys to go out and play 36, 38 minutes every night. And so you have to be very efficient with the time you have and time you have. And because of that, with, with more limited time, I leaned a lot more toward four on four defensive work, five on five offensive work than anything else. And then of course, as you mentioned, skill development, a lot of that pre and post practice Some of it we put in the practice, but that's pretty much what we were left with was those things when you get into an NBA season. Well, and I noticed a conscious effort. I'm assuming it was a conscious effort too. Like even though you were doing a lot of four on four or five on five, you weren't doing a lot of full court trips with it. And that has a lot to do with, I assume, the workload management part of it, that when you do end up going full court, you put more demands on your players. There's no question about it. I mean, when we get in training camp or even early in the season where you don't tend to play as many games, they give you a little bit more time to get into it. You would see a lot more full court work from us. But as you get into the C four times a week, going up and down at a pretty good pace, we try to cut the running part out. Not totally, but certainly limit it to times where you get two days in between games and things like that. You get those rare practices occasionally in the NBA where you get a practice after a day off. That's when you can go a little harder and get up and down, but you certainly cannot do it on a regular basis all year long. A lot of teams, quite honestly, don't do much live work during the season. You know, they'll run some what we call dummy offense against no defense and maybe a little bit of breakdown stuff, but they're not going to do much live work. I still like to go live keep it in the half court, maybe keep practice shorter. But I think it's important that for our development as a team that we're still doing uh, live work. And it's important for coaches to understand, because I think sometimes they have this fear of a game-based practice, practice that it's too demanding. But as you mentioned, you can manipulate whether you go full court or half court. You can obviously manipulate the length of the possession, all these different things that lead into it that can help you manage workload as well as, again, get purposeful reps. And, you know, the other part, Coach, I want to highlight and ask you about is that you would actually stop things and coach things, which seems like such a bizarre thing to ask a coach. But at so many practices I saw, coaches wouldn't stop and provide any type of technical tactical feedback within play. They would do it all as summary feedback. Can you talk about kind of your philosophy in terms of providing feedback to players within this, the type of practices that you run? Well, look, I think that any of us who, who teach understand that you need that immediate feedback to be able to make corrections. So, you know, if you're going to let things go and then 10 minutes later make some generalized comments, that's hard for a player to, and so 
I think it's a necessity that when a mistake is made, it's addressed as soon as possible, which allows those guys to then say, okay, this is what I did wrong. And now you come right back to another repetition and they're able to have a chance to do it correctly. And that was tremendous to see at the NBA level, because again, I think there's sometimes an assumption that NBA players are well-formed and you don't have to coach them. But just like all levels, we have to coach them and we have to provide them feedback because ultimately, by and large, what I saw, and maybe this is your experience or not, but NBA players want to get better. They do generally want to improve. There's absolutely no question about that. I think players at all levels do. I think as much as anything, that's what they expect out of coaches, especially in a practice setting, is that you will coach them and help make them better. And and I think NBA players understand that the more they improve, they have to to make the longer their careers are going to last, all of those things. And so I think for them, it's very, very important that they have somebody they think can help them get better. And if coached, I think they respond to that very well. And in that process, we talk about sometimes at the youth level that you kind of have to have an agreement with players that you have to communicate with them and help them understand the value of feedback and that it's not criticism. It's meant to be constructive. Do you have to have those conversations with NBA players sometimes too? All the time. And look, the word criticism has taken on a bad meaning, but it isn't a negative term even. I mean, you know, criticism goes back to being critical and critical is, you know, we're analyzing what's going on and seeing ways we can do things better. And I think as long as the focus is on doing things better, players respond well now, can do things better. And I think as long as the focus is on doing things better, players respond well now. I'll admit that I, like anybody else at times, can get into what I would call negativity, which is simply to tell them how bad they're playing with no real positive correction. That serves no value. Maybe venting for us as coaches, but it serves no value. But when you're talking about we've got to rotate quicker defensively or You've got to sink to take this cutter as your as your teammate goes to help. That's not negativity. That's explaining to somebody, even if you're loud about it, that's explaining to somebody what needs to be done. That, I think, is valuable. The negativity of just, we're playing, you know, like crap today, that doesn't do anybody any good. There's What can they do with that? That's not helping anybody improve. That's just saying you're doing a poor job, what you need to follow that up with is this is what we need to do better and being as specific as you can. You know, I mean, a lot of times it may be an effort thing where you say we've got to play harder. But to me, that still doesn't address what you're expecting out of the player. What is it you want him to do harder? What does he have to make his rotation quicker? Does he have to run harder on the fast break? Does he have to get off the floor to rebound the ball better? You know, I think you need to be specific about those things, what you want, rather than just generalize things that I think players have a hard time doing anything with. Such a great point. The coach speak that we use all the time, even when we generalize and say, hey, we've got to rebound better. Well, that's great. That's something specific. Such a great point. The coach speak that we use all the time. Even when we generalize and say, hey, we've got to rebound better. Well, that's great. That's something specific. But really, when we say we, do we really mean just Johnny and Todd? Like, we need to be even more specific sometimes. As as you said, if your players understand that criticism is something that's helpful and not negative, then you're able to do those things and more specifically get to the point that can help them improve. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Coach. And sometimes it's the we is easier on us as coaches. There's not a direct confrontation, if you will, because you certainly, you know, when you're saying we, no one tends to be really upset, but you'd also a lot of times aren't making the correction that needs to be made. But when you say, hey, John, you got to start blocking him out. He's killing us on the offensive glass. Get a body on him when the shot's in the air. 
And even more specifically, Gus, it might they stick a forearm in his chest and then block out. You know, you've got to say those things and you've got to identify where the problem is. And the problem a lot of times, like you say, is not generalized. Hey, John, you need to do a better job here. And this is what you need to do. Sure, that being singled out at times does not sit well with players, but you have to develop a culture in your program that everybody's going to get identified that way at times. There's nothing embarrassing about it. It's not meant to embarrass. We're simply out here to try to get better and improve. And it takes a lot of time. It's never perfect. There's always guys who get upset by it, but I don't think there's any other way to coach for improvement. No, that's great. And, you know, Ed, when you say we, everyone thinks they're talking about someone else. <laughs> so that's another part. That's absolutely right. And players use that term yeah. all the time. You know, we've, another that's problem. absolutely right. And players use that term yeah. all the time. You know, we've got to pass the ball more, which means you've got to get me the ball more. <laughs> yeah. You know, things like that. And you're right. I mean, look, my impression of just people in general is, there really tend to be, you know, conflict averse, you know, they just don't want to get into a confrontation. And so you use very general terms. And I understand that I don't think any of us likes confrontation necessarily. But if you're not going to address the root of the problem and what needs to be improved, then it's more than likely not going to be improved. Coach, with that, then how do you handle your frustration with a player who's struggling to do what's best for themselves or for the team? How do you handle that? Well, well, that all depends. I mean, I think first you've got to try problems and figure out what's going wrong. It may be, and this is something that I think that we don't do often enough as coaches is I think the first place you have to look is maybe we're not teaching this guy well I mean maybe it's the way we're approaching it maybe our teaching isn't good or maybe this guy learns a little bit differently and we've got to try something else which involves a lot of communication with the player talking to them asking them questions making sure they have an understanding and then I think from there if they do have an understanding of what you're talking about and what needs to be done and they still can't get the job done on the court. Now, there's a lot of areas you can look at. Number one, their effort is just not good enough. And that's something you can show them on film and talk about. It could be that they're physically not able to get with your strength and conditioning people, or if you're a coach that has to do everything on your own, it may be doing drills, things like that, physical things to make people more powerful, quicker things like that. And then it may be a technique problem. They may understand what you want them to accomplish and they may have the physical ability to do it, but their technique is poor. We find that a lot on the defensive end of the floor. And so you've got to get back and really do a lot of technique work. And if you don't have time in a practice to really break it down for your entire team all the time, if it's a problem with one or two individuals, then you've got to make sure that they get that extra work in. So there's a lot of reasons for players not to be able to execute. And I think the first step is figuring out with that individual player, why is it that that player cannot execute, cannot get the job done? Well, I love that you started with... Execute, cannot get the job done. Well, I love that you started with that. First, we have to look at ourselves. Because that's often what we want players to do, too. If they're not playing well, we want them to not blame others or make excuses. We want them to look at their own game and say, what can they do better? So that's tremendous. Coach, with that, how do we have these role conversations with players? You've obviously been in that situation so many times where you have to define a role for a player who isn't a superstar. And let's not worry about agents or anyone else that might be involved at the NBA level. Just as a coach to player, how do we help a player accept their role? Well, I think there's a couple of things. I think first, it starts with a very honest conversation. Again, a lot like we were talking about with the coaching. Uh, People really have problems, I think, a lot of times being honest because 
you know, you don't like delivering news that the other party news that the other party isn't going to want to hear. And it certainly for all of us, it's a lot more fun. If I can talk about the role for Blake Griffin, that's an easy conversation. You know, we're going to put the ball in your hands all the time. You're going to get plenty of opportunities to shoot. We're going to run our offense through you. That's a great conversation to have. No coach minds having that conversation. But when you're talking to, you know, a kid who thinks they're good enough to start, thinks they're good enough to be a primary scoring option, and you're saying, now, look, we're going to bring you off the bench, and I see you as a ball mover and a facilitator, well, those are tough conversations, and a lot of people avoid those conversations. And if you avoid those conversations and aren't clear of your expectations with a certain player, I think a couple of things happen. Number one, it's not fair that player on things he's not aware you're judging him on. And then secondly, it, it's very tough for your team to perform effectively if people don't understand their role. So you've got to have honest conversations, number one. Number two is you really do have to be positive about how that role that you envision for the player benefits that player. In other words, I think with all of your players, you're really trying to play to their strengths. And look, it can be as simple as, look, you're a great screener. You're one of the best screeners we have, and we need that to get people open And look, Tommy, you're going to find the better screens you set, the more you're going to be open, as we all know as coaches. So I do think as you get into role definition, besides just being honest, you have to let the player know how it's going. Besides just being honest, you have to let the player know how it's going to benefit him and what you're trying to do to put him in a position to succeed, play to his strengths, disguises weaknesses. The second part's hard because a lot of players don't really see themselves as having any weaknesses. And again, that goes back to the honesty that you just can't be afraid of. Oh, that's great. And I mean, so many coaches are in those situations and you're right. It's such a difficult conversation. And I guess this leads me to a really interesting question for me is as an NBA head coach, are there things that you would have done if it wasn't for maybe the stigma or the beliefs that players have like say it's something that a player like or it's rooted in tradition or it's just something that they do like are there certain things that limit you sometimes as a coach at the NBA level because of tradition or because of players beliefs or agents beliefs or certainly those can come up you know I think the biggest one in the NBA now is things have changed over the I mean I came into the league in 1995 and at that time practice and even hard physical practices were accepted as the norm. And that's become less and less and less every year to the point now, there's quite honestly, quite a few teams that don't practice much at all, almost never do anything live. If they do practice, it's going to be really, really short. And so if you're a coach now, that really believes in practice and believes in doing things. I mean, players would say the old school way. I would just say the way that makes us better. If you believe in that, it does get difficult because this belief has seeped into the NBA mindset that what we need is rest and always rest. And so as coaches, like I said before, you struggle, at least I did, with the balance between work and rest the players always think it should be more rest and they have friends on other teams and those teams are playing well and yet they don't practice much. And it has become accepted by a lot of NBA players now that that's the way things should be. There should not be a lot of practice and work. I don't happen to believe that. And, and so at times that's a hard sell and you do have to give a little bit to them. So I think all of us, I think, you know, the guys I know myself, Eric Spolstra, Steve Clifford, Tom Thibodeau, the guys I know that still very much believe in practice and things. I think you would find even there that all of us practice shorter and do a little bit less live contact work 
than we did 10, than we did 10, 15 years ago, because you know what players' mindsets are. We won't give in all the way. We're certainly not going to not practice or do live work but you do understand the mindset that's out there. And so, yeah, you do do things a little bit differently, at least, than you would in a vacuum. It's a great answer, and it's great to understand, too, because I, I think at all levels, I mean, we're influenced somewhat by factors other than sometimes what's just our number one belief of what we should be doing. And I'm curious as well, if it's something as, as simple as ball screen defense, and you have the greatest plan in your mind going in, to a situation, but your players don't buy in, then it's not the greatest plan. Is that, no, that part that's of the absolutely process? Right. Well, yeah, I think that any of us in coaching, and I don't care what level, being able to sell the way that you want to play and what your expectations are is huge. When I was growing up playing, there was really no thought of that, right? I mean, you were going to play the way the coach said because he's the coach. I mean, that's all it was. Our world has changed. And I think, quite honestly, it's a positive. I think it's a positive now that players and just people in general in school question things and want to know why. And then, you know, they're certainly going to have their own value judgments of, you know, of whether or not that's a good way to go. I have personally liked that as a coach. It's one of the things I think has helped me more than anything as an NBA coach, because quite honestly, if you can't answer the question of why we're doing it this way, then you haven't done a good job thinking it out and you shouldn't expect players to buy into it. If you have thought it out, which, you know, hopefully you have, you'll be able to explain it. And, and quite honestly, you'll have given it a lot more thought than a player has. So the player will have, than a player has. So the player will have, in most cases, a, an idea on, say, defending the pick and roll that is a sort of off the top of his head or something he's seen once or twice. Meanwhile, you've watched hours and hours of film and can come back and show him on film and cite statistics and explain what you're going to do. And in most cases, the vast majority of cases, the player is going to come around and understand I think more than anything, a lot of times they just want to be assured that this is something that you've really thought about. And so when they're saying, well, why don't we do it this way? I think their belief becomes greater when you can answer that question in great detail and they understand exactly what it is that you want to do. I had an assistant, Brendan Malone, who was the first head coach of the Toronto Raptors, and I had him as an assistant in both Orlando in Detroit, and he would constantly remind me. I, when I say constantly, I'm going to say almost daily. He would always say to me, coach the why. Coach the why. Make sure we coach the why, which basically means that players have to understand why we're doing it this way. And it's not a good answer to say because that's the way coach wants it done. The answer is this is best because of A, B, C, and D. And so he would always tell me, coach the why. And I, and I think that's huge in getting buy-in from the players. Well, and I saw that at your practices. I saw that there was open dialogue, you know, within the practice between coaches and players. And there was communication and there was questions. And I think that's such a positive part of a great learning environment. Coach, maybe switching gears a little bit here. What type of things are on your suit pocket card? What are on your game day card that you have every game or that you have from a game-to-game -game basis that coaches should be thinking about handy for them? Well, my game day card on one side was basically just a listing of all of our sets. And then what I would do from that is highlight or star certain things that I definitely wanted to run that night that I thought from our preparation would be uh, successful in that night. Then on uh, – other side, it would be lineup specific sets. So, you know, with my starting lineup, these are the things I want to run, including things that I wanted to run for each guy. So, you know, I want to run this stuff for Blake Griffin and I want to run this stuff for Reggie Jackson, things like that. But when I go to my second unit, now these are the things we're going to look to do. I would have those things on there. I would have entire list, probably 20, 25 things that I wanted to think about after timeouts, plays to draw up and run, things we had been 
on the other team's specials, after timeout plays, late game plays, things like that, that they would run. I would have their free throw shooting on there. So if we had to foul people late in the game, I would always have their stuff on there. So really a lot of stuff, but but different sections so that in the course of the game, I was basically feeding off my lineup related sets, things I wanted to run. If I come to a timeout, I would turn to that section looking for plays I wanted to run after a timeout. If it was late game and the other team had the ball, I'd have their specials there. So I knew where everything was on my card. I'd all wanted it on one card, but yeah, that I could get to the things that I needed to get to. Well, it's a lot of information, obviously. So having that card is handy. And coach, let's get into special situations then, because you talked about not practicing a lot at the NBA level, but the game day shoot around becomes the pra- shoot around becomes the practice essentially, right? Like is a game day shoot around where you're going through special situations, you're reviewing plays. Is that what you're doing? Or are you going through the other opponent's sets? Like what's the main part of the game day shoot around in your mind? Well, so for us, you know, we would be on the floor an hour, sometimes a little more, particularly early in the year. We're probably going to use 40 to 45 minutes of that going through how we want to defend our opponents. So we're going to walk through you know, a high percentage of their set, certainly more than our players thought that we should do on every given day. I mean, we're going to go through a lot of stuff, but making sure that we understand our principles, really focusing on things, we're making an adjustment away from maybe our normal principles because of personnel or whatever. So we're going to spend most of our time on that personnel or whatever. So we're going to spend most of our time on that. We're going to spend 15 to 20 minutes on offense. If there's plays that we haven't run a lot lately, maybe haven't worked on a lot lately, but we think we'll be successful in that game, we'll go over those. If it's a team, let's say, which is rare in the NBA, where you're either going to see press or zone, you'll review that stuff. And then usually, because you don't have a lot of that stuff to go over, you're going to have 10 minutes or more to you know, review uh, out of bounds and and late game situations, things like that, special plays that don't come up a lot that we didn't spend a ton of practice time on necessarily, but we would review them in the walkthrough. And for special situations or ATOs, would they always be something that your players have seen at some point, even if it wasn't during that game day shoot, so they have general can pick that up? How does that work in terms of that? Most of the time, it was going to be something that we had practiced and worked on. There have been times where I have drawn up something that we haven't worked on. To be honest with you, I think the success rate of those things tends to be a lot lower. Your execution isn't as good. I would draw things up more if they were very, very simple. It was basically a one screen or we're going to get the ball to a guy in an isolation type situation late in the game or simply get the ball inbounds and get to a high pick and roll, something like that. Anything that had more than one option would not be something that I would just draw up. You know, that would have to be something that we worked on. But if it was a quick one option thing, you could draw it up. NBA players are very smart. Most of them pick things up very quickly some guys are that would have to be something that we worked on but if it was a quick one option thing you could draw it up NBA players are very smart most of them pick things up very quickly some guys are better than others at seeing things on a diagram and being able to do it some of them even the smartest ones who pick things up quickly need to do it on the floor I mean simply looking at a diagram just doesn't make as much sense to them And so, again, I would only do that if it was a very simple type play. And that leads into the approach to timeouts. Are there there any strategies that you can share with coaches about how to get players to focus within timeouts or even to check for understanding? Like, you know, the whole thing, like, you guys get it, you understand? Well, of course, they're going to say yes. But are there specific strategies that you've found through your career that help with timeout focus and timeout understanding? 
Well, I think number one, it's something that you have to practice from time to time. We know when you're in training time to time, we know when you're in training camp, things like that, to be able to call a timeout, and draw something up. I think that's important for them to give them practice of doing that. But it's also important for you as a coach, especially if you have new players to understand going into a season, who's capable of doing that, taking a play on a diagram and being able to go out and execute it and who isn't. And, and those guys, if you're going to have them in the game, you need to stick to stuff that you've run over and over and over again. So, so I think, you know, like anything else in the game, you've got to practice it. I think as you're doing things in the huddle, you really have to be checking for focus and eye contact, concentration and things like that. There's so many things going on in an NBA timeout, you know, I mean, uh, the dancers are out there and there's stuff playing, you know, there's music blaring, there's, you know, stuff on the screens. It's not an ideal situation for people to concentrate, there's, you know, stuff on the screens. It's not an ideal situation for people to concentrate. And so you have to make sure that they are tuned in and, and yeah, you can, you know, with certain guys and especially that, you know, you can say at the end of it, okay, what are you doing on this play after it's explained and, and see if they've got it. Even with all of that, you're still going to have times where guys come out and just blank, but you got to know who those guys are because if it's a late game situation, those are guys that are tough to have in the game. Oh, that's great. Good advice. And there's definitely a lot going on in an NBA timeout. There's no question that always challenges players to focus. So coach, if you could choose one thing for an assistant coach to do in a game that helps you the most, what would it be? One thing. Well, getting to one thing would be hard, but I think to me, if you have a, an assistant coach who's he on the floor, the opponent's defense and figure out ways that we can exploit that and get good shots. I mean, the thing where I struggle more than anything in a game, and I think every coach a little bit different in this is when you're struggling offensively, what are we going to do to get a shot? And I think guys who can really recognize defense and see where there are openings, either things you can call or adjustments you can make or an after timeout play or anything, not just a guess, not just throwing out, hey, let's try this, but, you know, really well reasoned out, you know, they're playing us this way we can get this or what's going to be open. They're forcing our pick and roll in the middle of the floor left and pull it in. So where we're going to be open is in the weak side corner, the right corner to get our best shooter down there. Things like that, that help you get better offense is where I wanted the help. I, I pretty much could recognize things on the floor pretty easily in terms of defensive adjustments that needed to be made. But if I could get offensive help, that's what I wanted more than anything. But again, for different assistants can help you in different ways. I think your question's the first one, what do you as a head coach need? And that involves you recognizing your own strengths and weaknesses too. But also what are the strengths and weaknesses of your staff? So I had a guy like Tim Hardaway who you know, was an NBA all-star and a point guard and had a great understanding of the game and saw the floor. And he was very good with finding things offensively that would be open. Now, at times you can have guys with a lot less experience and maybe where they can help you is simply the black and white of keeping the black and white of keeping something statistically that you think is important, whether it's, you know, deflections or blockouts or fast break points or the number of times you get the ball into the paint offensively. I think with less experienced assistance, having a chore like that on the bench, something you can use, you know, to say, Hey, we haven't gotten the ball in the paint on five straight possessions. We're not attacking the defense, not only something you can mention to your team, but affects you in terms of what sets you want to run that may give you a better chance to get the ball down in there. So like with everything and like with players, it depends on everyone's strengths and weaknesses, I think. Yeah, that's a great answer. And uh, coach, let's get into some kind of technical stuff here. And look, I saw it, and we don't have to talk about a specific situation, but I saw it last night with Giannis that a defender left his feet 
to challenge Giannis's three point shot. Thanks, Baskas. Should we stay down or should we challenge shots by leaving our feet? Like we all say second off the ground, but hey, easier said than done. So what is the best practice in your mind right now? Well, I think it is that. I think it's be the second jumper. It is very, very hard, things like that. But as we'll say to players all the time, winning's hard, and it requires discipline and things like that. Now, I think it's also all personnel-based. I mean, I would never leave my feet on a Giannis shot fake on the perimeter, regardless. When we had, we didn't do it as much as other teams, but when we switched a big onto a perimeter player on a pick and roll, we didn't want them to ever jump, ever. Play with the hand up, jump shot over the top, try to contain the ball, but never jump on anybody's jump shot because big guys I have found more susceptible to shot fakes than anyone else on anybody's jump shot because big guys I have found more susceptible to shot fakes than anyone else. But for the most part, we taught just what you said. We're going to be the second jumper, and you've got to stay down until that guy goes up. And I think a lot of it involves a lot of defense, I think. And this one, I haven't been as successful as I would like getting across the players, but I think it involves your eyes and where you're locked in. If my eyes are locked in on someone's midsection on their gut, I don't get faked as much. Pass fakes, foot fakes on the dribble, shot fakes, any of that. Anytime I'm ball watching, I'm going to be very, very susceptible. So to me, something like that, it's a discipline issue. But I really think a lot of individual defense on the ball comes down to your eyes. And it comes up to the other example, which is like, it's easy to say, okay, let's stay in the paint. Don't leave the paint if Giannis is on the throw on someone like that versus, you know, obviously saying, hey, shoot it. We want you to shoot it. Is that a difficult balance in the NBA nowadays? It's hard, actually, because, you know, you do have to listen to your players, especially your better defenders on some of those things, because if you back up like on Ben Simmons and on Giannis, if you're going to play them in the paint, they're going to bring the ball all the way to you and then just spin off of contact and you've let them get all the way into the paint. It's easy for them. So certainly the ball has to be picked up out on the floor a little bit more. We pretty much wanted to pick everybody up at the three-point line. And then from there, we could play you with a little bit of a cushion. I also think when you pick the ball up higher, if they're running pick and roll, if you pick the ball up higher, it's easy to go under. If if you're going to pick the ball up inside of the top of the key, and then they come up and set a pick ball up inside of the top of the key, and then they come up and set a pick and roll, and you're trying to go under that pick because the guy's not a great shooter, he's already into the paint. And so, yeah, I personally think even with non-shooters, you've got to pick the ball up out on the floor. Now, you're going to cushion enough that you can't. Our rule was basically you're going to play with enough cushion that you never get beat by the first step. So there's no way Ben Simmons or Giannis can take one step and be by you. That step will still be in front of you. So you're basically playing a little bit more than a step off. And then it comes down to, you know, the little things, just like you were talking about, we're not going up on shot fakes. You know, we're not going to worry if they shoot the ball. Even if they make one or two, we're going to stay disciplined to what we believe. That's great. One step doesn't beat you. That's such an important part of that. And coach, the mid post up seems to be another trend. One step doesn't beat you. That's such an important part of that. And coach, the mid post up seems to be another trend. If you look at Blake Griffin or some of these guys, they're in the middle of the free throw line posting up now. And I think we have a pretty good understanding of some of the things you can do in the low post in terms of covering a low post up, which again, doesn't happen as much nowadays. What are some strategies to be able to cover that mid post up? Because it's really hard to help in the middle of the floor? There's no question. And I think that's why you see more and more people trying to run offense in the middle of the floor, whether it's pick and rolls in the middle of the floor, throwing the guys at the elbow or right at the free throw line and playing off of there, because it is a lot harder to load your defense up when there's, when the ball's not on one side of the floor. So I think the first thing is, you know, with all of us, you're going to try to limit those catches in the middle of the floor or at least extend them. So rather than letting that guy catch the ball 
at the free throw line or a better chance to be able to defend and more time for your help to get there on a drive. So I, I think where the ball is caught is huge. And then you've got to, uh, even when it's there, you've got to shrink the floor and, and be as packed in as you can to get help on those great players with a real knowledge of personnel on the floor. So with the ball in the middle of the floor, let's say top of the key, we would want to play close to the NBA elbow. But that depends. If you're on Kyle Korver, you're not going to be as close to that elbow. And if you're on, if Joel Embiid is isolated and you're on Ben Simmons, you can really be off the help. So there's always a personnel component, but you're going to have to shrink the floor and get help to those guys as much as you can. But that's a lot easier if you've got the catch extended out on the floor. And that raises the question of situational denial, which, again, I, I know there's so many teams below the NBA, so many teams below the NBA level that pack line and different things like that. But the trends I see in the NBA or certainly in Europe more is situational denial. So whether you call it top blocking or denial, whatever you call it, like those situations seem to be, again, I assume they're more personnel driven in your experience than they are. Or are they set driven or do you go into a game plan sometimes saying, hey, let's top block J.J. Redick so he can't come to the ball on his first step? Is it stuff like that yeah. that's driving that? Well, on, on that stuff, like on, on a guy coming off a screen, yeah, that'll be different based on where the screen is on the floor or a lot on who you're playing against So, and trying to take away their strengths. I don't think we ever had a time where we – okay with letting them catch the ball at the elbow now we weren't very good at it at times I think guys get a little lazy there there are guys catching the ball at the elbow back to the basket they don't think that's a huge threat so they don't extend the catch enough but I from a coaching standpoint we tried to emphasize that was one area we're not a denial team on the wing on the perimeter catches at the three-point line and stuff but we never wanted the ball caught at the free throw line or the elbow I just think that's an area that makes it very, very tough to defend. I mean, a guy hits cutters from there. They're running dribble handoffs. They can isolate there. It's tough. So some of them are basic principles you're going to have all the time. But guys running off screens, things like that, yeah, that would be personnel related. Well, and the other part that you raise there is, is like players sometimes don't deny, say, the high post or whatever because they get blamed for the back door. When the reality is it's the help that's responsible for the back door. But I think a misunderstood part about NBA defense is, as you mentioned already about shooters or different people you're covering, it's really hard to be in help one pass or two passes away, sometimes based on personnel. So how would you frame that for a player in terms of forcing a catch higher? Because again, one pass or two passes away, sometimes based on personnel. So how would you frame that for a player in terms of forcing a catch higher, but they get beat back door in terms of responsibility? Well, we shouldn't get beat back door because, again, our priority is not to deny necessarily, which would mean not letting the guy catch the ball. I mean, the term we use most of the time was extend the catch. And so there were two things. We talked about a contact denial. So a hand on the guy's hip and the arm in the passing lane, forcing him to step out to catch the ball, but not getting all the way up where we have no contact with the guy where we're getting back cut. So we didn't want the back cut. Yes, there should be help, but we did not want back cuts at all. We simply wanted to extend the guy up the floor. Yeah, it's great. And what are you supposed to do nowadays in the NBA? One pass away on defense. Coaches start to be thinking about like, can you run and jump different matchups? Can you do different things to disrupt occasionally and gamble? Or should it be just be straight up, sometimes we're going to give up a layup because we can't help one pass away? Well, look, I think that's a big philosophical decision for any coach. I think that's where it's, it starts. Before you get into any game plan on opponents, philosophy. You know, I think that ideally, I mean, the, the perfect NBA defense would limit a team's free throw attempts because it's the highest percentage shot in the game, layup attempts, the second highest percentage, and limit three-point attempts, which is the third highest percentage in the game. Clearly, those things don't all go together, <laughs> you know. Right. And so I think, first of all, you know, the offenses have gotten so good in the NBA, the three-point shooting has gotten so good 
And most teams are putting the offenses have gotten so good in the NBA. The three point shooting has gotten so good. And most teams are putting four guys out there that can shoot the three and sometimes five. So everyone has to be covered. So you have to come to an understanding of we can't take away everything. So where are your priorities? I think the problem right now with a lot of teams is quite honestly, they get to a point of their taking away nothing. And the three has, I think, really had a psychological effect on coaches and players defensively. So people are so afraid of giving up threes, which is still the third most efficient shot in the game. Not the most efficient, not the second most efficient, but the third most efficient shot in the game. And yet it seems like it's every, a lot of teams just opening up the most efficient but the third most efficient shot in the game. And yet it seems like it's every, a lot of teams first priority defensively because the three bothers them so much that now we're just opening up the floor and letting the ball go to the basket for layups or trying to stop the layup for fouls. So got to decide how you're going to do that. I think the preeminent idea in the NBA now is first of all, we're not going to put two guys on the ball to leave somebody open so we're going to switch everything but now what i see is a switching thing and then you're leaving your power forward or center on a guy like kyrie irving one-on-one and you're not really helping because of not wanting to give up the three and those guys are just torching you and that's why you see a guy like kimba walker getting kyrie have all 40 point games now but then there are teams like milwaukee who has had a lot of success this year defensively is they switched nothing and they absolutely pack the paint and they're going to take that stuff away and then try to close out. So they are giving up a lot of three point attempts, but they have good length. They play hard. They've been able for the most part to limit people's three point percentage to a reasonable number. And they're not giving up layups and they're not sending people to the free throw line. It's going to be very difficult to take away all three of those things. So you got to decide where your priorities are. And to me, I would focus more on limiting free throws and layups than I would on the threes. That's interesting. And you said the part about switching too, and it can be demoralizing to the player that switches on to Kyrie or, or Kemba, because again, they're going to, I mean, this is how we're going to get beat. If they're going to beat us, it's doing this. So it's not your fault. This is our strategy. And that's got to be a part of the sell that you're, you're giving to your players in those situations, isn't it? Well, there's no question about that because, again, you've got to decide what it is you're trying to take away. And you've got to expect your players to be very disciplined to that. And then they have to understand that, okay, hey, look, I, we got beat on this, but, you know, this is what coach wants as a scheme. And this is why. This is how we're going to play it. And you got to live with some of it. And I would say to players a lot of times on baskets, that's on me. You know, there's ones that, yeah, you got beat. That's on me. That's how we're going to play. We'll make adjustments if we need to. But you do have to have a, a basic philosophy. I think it's funny actually watching right now to me because as I look at people's defense, a lot of guys who can supposedly trying to limit threes are giving up a lot of layups and points in the paint. I think the teams like Memphis and Milwaukee, who have really focused on keeping the ball out of the paint, have been the successful defensive teams early in this season. Now, Boston switches a lot, but they've got a lot of guys who can really move their feet, and they do a great job staying in plays and contesting shots at the rim. So they've been the most successful of the switch everything, limit threes, approach but most of those teams to me and looking at the numbers have not been very successful yeah it's going to be interesting because I mean there's such great coaching at the NBA level and I I believe it 
so many levels that we'll see how coaches figure it out. But the other thing, obviously, there's a rise in dribble handoffs. You know, they're not new, but certainly some teams are running so many dribble handoffs. And is there a method of covering dribble handoffs that you think is not new, but certainly some teams are running so many dribble handoffs? And is there a method of covering dribble handoffs that you think is best overall? Or is it simply, again, we've got to keep changing so the defense or so the offense never knows exactly how it's going to be covered or what's the philosophy nowadays with dribble handoffs? Well, I think there's a lot of ways you can cover them and, and a lot of it's going to be personnel related. I think a couple of things are constant. Number one is I always think we focus on the guy who's going to receive the dribble handoff, but it really starts with the guy with the ball. Number one, if we can extend his catch out on the floor and then with us, we wanted to try to pressure that guy as he put the ball on the floor. I think too many times we let those big guys just take one or two dribbles to wherever they want to go on the floor, totally unpressured where they can now be lining up the defender for a screen, screen, hand the ball off quick, cleanly, all of that stuff. I think you've got to get pressure on those guys to begin with. With us, our big emphasis on the guy coming to the ball was to still make him come to the ball. I mean, I think what you see a lot, so many of these guys are, are so good without the ball, and they want to deny you the ball coming to the handoff. And so you end up giving up a lot of back cuts in those situations. Turn on any NBA game, and you're going to see multiple back cuts off of dribble handoffs every night. And so, again, I think you have to be disciplined. It's hard. You're playing a guy like J.J. Redick, playing a guy like, Chris Middleton or Kyle Korver or Clay Thompson, Steph Curry, these great shooters. And, you know, you don't want them to be able to come off and shoot the ball cleanly. And so you start trying to beat them to the spot and deny on the ball, push the guy coming to the handoff to the ball. And then you've either got to try to, at the point of intersection, try to blow it up and get through, get an arm in there on the handoff or on certain guys, not the great shooters, but on others, you can go under and go between the man handing the ball off and your teammate and get through. But most of the time we were coming over the top. Then we're playing it like a pick and roll. The big is playing between the ball and the basket. At times we would blitz or trap that handoff. But if we weren't, the big would stay between the ball and the basket until the guard could get back in front and if he really got nailed and couldn't get back in front, then we'd have to veer back, which ends up being a switch. But that wasn't the preferred way of, of playing it. Right. And it veer is a term that I heard a lot at your practices. Can you just quickly explain that to coaches, what a veer is? Yeah, we're trying to get through, stay with our own. Quickly explain that to coaches, what a veer is. Yeah, we're trying to get through, stay with our own man, get back in front of the ball. But if that ball turns a corner, and really a great guideline is if the big guy who's helping has to turn his shoulders because the ball just turns a corner and goes to the rim, then the guard is going to simply veer back to his teammate's man, to the big guy. It ends up being a switch. The difference is we're not switching that as a game plan thing. We're not going into it saying, we're switching this dribble handoff or we're switching this pick and roll. But if the ball gets downhill and I can no longer have any chance to get back in front of the ball or even to be on the side to defend the ball, then I'm going to veer back to the other guy and we're just going to yell veer and, uh, and we're going to have to switch that. It's a late switch. The problem, it's a scheme. It's something you need to have. The guard sort of, unless you really stay on and take the easy way out and turn every hand off into a veer back so they don't have to work to get over the screen and to get back in front of the ball. So you're always fighting human nature a little bit. And I will encourage coaches below the NBA level to take a look at the concept because it's something that's helped us since I've seen you guys do it. It's helped us tremendously solve problems, right? Like inevitably offense makes the right decision versus our defense or one of our defenders makes a mistake. And the veer or late switch has helped us solve problems where otherwise we might be in trouble if we didn't do it. And it's become a part of our defense, which has been interesting. So coach, the other thing, as you're talking, like I've always thought about this and maybe it's a bad idea. Maybe you've seen it before. 
is it possible to ice dribble handoffs? Because that lateral dribble, you talked about pressuring the dribbler, which I totally understand and get that philosophy. But the other part, if it's a non-shooter dribbling to a handoff, is it possible, which I totally understand and get that philosophy. But the other part, if it's a non-shooter dribbling to a handoff, is it possible to drop and to almost ice that handoff? Or is that something that's a little crazy? Because it's hard to turn and shoot on a lateral dribble. No, it is. And it's certainly possible. The, the problem is, is most guys are going to be good enough. If you're going to drop when they have the ball, even if they're non-shooters, they're simply going to dribble the ball right at you down into the paint. Now they're at six feet and one quick spin and they're at the rim. So we wanted to go the other way and pressure the ball. Even with guys who weren't shooters, you can drop. There are people who did drop on us. Uh, the Brooklyn Nets, Kenny Atkinson against non-shooting bigs. As soon as their guy gets the ball, he actually drops all the way down in front of the rim. Then they can really pressure and try to deny the handoff because there's no backdoor pass because rim. Then they can really pressure and try to deny the handoff because there's no backdoor pass because the big is right there. But there's also no ball pressure. And so we were able to run our offense pretty effectively. The other thing that became a problem is, you know, we had a great offensive rebounder in Andre Drummond. And so when that big was back under there, it was hard for him to keep Andre from having a running start at the rim when somebody got a shot off. So he always had great success against them on the offensive glass. So there's no scheme that's perfect, but I would say if people are interested in that, playing non-shooters that way, Brooklyn would be a good team to watch. Yeah, no, it's just interesting because I think, again, at other levels, we deal with a lot more players that maybe can't shoot off that situation. But just a curious question. and Coach, if you have some time, can we maybe dive in a little bit? Take off your NBA hat and say you're coaching at youth level or another level. Do you be, should we be forcing we can more, for example, or we should be forcing, you know, directions? What do you think is the best practice nowadays for coaches to consider? I think in general, the concept we all start teaching little kids to play basketball is the way you should start. Stay between your man and the basket. And that was our basic concept in the NBA. I mean, you want to limit penetration to the basket. So I do think being able to influence Uh, players to their weekend or to a direction they're not as good at is very important. The technique of that is important. I think what happens most of the time when you talk about forcing a guy left is they don't force him left, they give him left. And it's a straight line to the rim. So you have to be very, very clear on the stance in that situation. With us, when we wanted to influence players in a certain direction, We did not want to try to stay, again, square to the ball handler and simply move over half a step so that our body, our sternum, was splitting the guy's strong hand so that he had opening to his weak hand, but not a straight line. We didn't want to open up our shoulders to that. So that's how we tried to play it. But you do have to be careful on the technique and on the mindset. It's not good enough to simply let the guy go to his left and beat you. But we still want to contain the ball. So we want to influence it a certain way because we think it's harder for the ball to beat us that way. But you still have the responsibility for trying to contain the ball. I don't think we want a mentality with kids that it's okay to get beaten in either direction. No, no, no. we're working to contain the ball. And this is what we think is the best way to do that. It's great insight in terms of that for coaches to consider. And the other one is from diving in a little bit to some federations and their development model that pick and roll is introduced in later stages. Is that something that we should be doing earlier since it is such a big part of the game? Or what would be your philosophy in terms of introducing pick and roll and the importance of it to the game of basketball? Well, I think you can do it on a limited basis with younger kids. But to expect them to make a lot of reads and everything else, and quite honestly, at the younger ages, there doesn't tend to be as much of variability in height. Obviously, the older we get, there's more variability in height. So what I've seen, a little bit I've seen of youth basketball, when you do run pick and rolls, you just see switches all the time. 
and certainly they don't have the sophistication of combating switches. So I don't think there should be a heavy dose of that at a young age, but a simple pick and roll to maybe give the guy your, you know, a player up. So I don't think there should be a heavy dose of that at a young age, but a simple pick and roll to maybe give the guy your, you know, a player a little bit of an advantage to turn the corner and penetrate can be done. I certainly think at the high school level, you can get into running pick and rolls. And I think it's good for your guards to start learning those reads of what they're looking for against things. And I think the guys that get a chance to do that, a significant amount at the high school level, certainly have a, a leg up if they're going to play at the university level or beyond. And that leads into another question. And maybe if you looked at some of the NBA players you've coached, and if you were to go back and be their high school coach or elementary coach, what are some of the things that those players are missing as they get to you in the development model? What are some things that we could do a better job of at the younger levels at developing players? And not every player is going to be an NBA player by any stretch, but an NBA player, we're looking at contributing positively to anyone's development, I think, in basketball. So what are some things that we're missing at those development levels? Look, I think the number one thing, and I would say this at every level all the time, it's is fundamentals, fundamentals, fundamentals. Footwork, passing and catching with two hands, the ability to throw different passes, the ability to, you know, shoot layups with either hand and, and be able to take off off either foot or off of two feet and finishing moves around the basket and, a, you know, a solid on-balance jump shot that'll work. All those fundamentals to me are more important than anything. And that's at every level. I mean, a guy who can handle a ball against pressure and, and get to spots on the floor to create shots for himself or teammates. I, I don't think it's a scheme thing. I think a guy that defensively can get down and move his feet and contain the go back down and move his feet and contain the ball and, and have some technique for getting over screens and understands how to block out on the boards it always will go back to fundamental things. And the more that players can learn those things and learn to execute fundamentals at game speed, the better off that they're going to be. It's something that we fight at every level, the youth level to high school to university level and, and into the pros. It's, it's about doing fundamental things better and quicker. That's the edge that players get. Well, that's great advice. And maybe as a final question, if you could coach it, just what methods did you do to evaluate your own coaching? What were some things that you did to evaluate your own coaching? And this gives insight to us as coaches about how we can work on improving. And let's focus specifically, if you could, on after a game. When you have, not, not, not everybody does, but I think more and more with technology you do. I, I think film becomes the best teacher. When you sit back down and watch the film and can evaluate the quality of shots you got and the quality of shots your opponents got, and if you're not getting good shots or if the other team is getting too good of shots, why? What is it that your team isn't doing well enough? And I always looked at that as something we're either not emphasizing enough or not teaching well enough. I mean, I think it's very hard as a coach, and hopefully coaches don't do it, to look at a team playing a certain part of the game poorly and thinking, you know, I'm coaching great, they're playing poorly. Our job is to get them to play well. And so if something isn't being done well, that is something that you need to go back and work on. If it isn't being done well, that is something that you need to go back and work on. Dick Bennett, the best college coach I ever saw in the United States, son Tony is at Virginia now. Dick once said to me, watch your team and they'll tell you what you need to work on. And I think that is so true. And so when you're evaluating yourself as a coach and you're saying, boy, we don't take care of the ball. Well, you're looking and co- you got a lot of guys throwing one-handed passes, not catching the ball with two hands, things like that. You're not coaching that well enough. So We need to go work on that the next day, however you think's best. Same thing with anything defensively. I think the film will show you what you're doing well, what you're not doing well, and what you need to do 
going into practice. And then I think there's the other variables that may not be as directly film related. Did you feel like, you know, hey, we were yesterday or maybe we did too much contact yesterday or whatever. And then, you know, how are you affecting your team? That was always a big one with me because I tended to be pretty emotional on the sidelines. I think sometimes to a benefit and sometimes to a detriment of my team. And so, you know, did I get on them so hard that they basically hung their heads instead of picking it up and fighting, you know, and they have to address the words you use and the tone you used in the huddle. I always felt that my uh, assistants could help me a great deal on those types of things. No, that's great insights. And, you know, it's that process even of evaluating your own decisions within the game as a coach and whether you would have done something different in retrospect or all those different things that come up within a game. So, Coach. Yeah, look, and I think those decisions you've got to be a little careful on because, you know, there's a lot of times, I will say this, I say it to the media all the time after games, and I believe it, if it wasn't the right decision. And I think you have to live with that as a coach, that it's a bottom line business. But with that said, it doesn't mean that you wouldn't do it the exact same way the next time. I remember a playoff game when I was in Orlando, and we decided going into that series against Boston that late in the game, any type of pick and roll with Paul Pierce, and he'd been a great late game guy, we were going to blitz him. We were going to trap him. And then we would live with whatever happened. And we played a playoff game at home in Orlando. We trapped him on the last play of the game. The ball swung to Glenn Big Baby Davis, and he hit a jump shot that beat us. After the game, they asked me, you know, if that was the right move. And I said it wasn't the right move because if it doesn't work, it wasn't right. But if we get the same situation again, we're trapping him again. And so you have to be willing to take the criticism that it didn't work out, but understand in your own mind, would I take the criticism that it didn't work out, but understand in your own mind, Would I play that the same way or did I learn something or did I learn something from it that would change the way I did it? And it can't just be the result because we got beat on that play. But if you're telling me in the game, I'm either going to get a Paul Pierce jump shot or a Glenn Big Baby Davis jump shot, I'm going to live with that every day of the week and we'll see what happens. No, it's great because the same thing applies to offense in the sense that if you created an open shot and the player missed the shot, it doesn't mean it was the wrong play. But again, in that situation, it, it, it didn't work. But it doesn't mean it was the No, it didn't call. work. Yeah. And I think at times as a coach, we get sensitive to the criticism, whether at our level it comes from the media or at lower levels it comes from the parents or whatever. Why would you run the play for you know Joe instead of for my son? I mean, you're going to get criticized. When things don't work, as a coach, you need to learn in this business and to be okay with it. That's going to be part of the job. Don't get defensive. Don't get sensitive to it. Be able to objectively look at it yourself and understand if it doesn't work, I'm going to take the criticism, but I'm going to objectively analyze if I were in that situation again, am I comfortable with what we got? If you are, you move on with that conviction. If you're not, you make the change the next time, but don't change just because the result didn't go and you got some criticism. I mean, I think a lot of people at the lower levels where you can't advance the ball, you know, after a timeout late in the game, a lot of people will call timeout because if you don't call timeout on the last shot and you let your team run it up the floor and they miss, that's always going to invite criticism. If you call the timeout and set something up, even if it doesn't work floor, but you can't coach worried about criticism because if the better way to get a good shot in your mind is to get the ball up the floor in an unstructured situation, then that's what you should do and damn the criticism. But it's just to me, coaches in general, biggest thing you have to be prepared for as a young coach, especially, you're going to get criticized. Every game your team does not win, You're going to get criticized by somebody, your players, the parents, the media, you know, whoever it may be. And you better come to grips with that early on, or it's going to be very hard for you to uh, remain in this business. Great point. And obviously the part about the outcome skews the evaluation. 
I mean, I imagine your recall of games is pretty good after the games, but until you watch that film and actually review it on your own, sometimes you're either too hard on what happened or you're going, hey, we played really well, but then I watch the film and go on your own. Sometimes you're either too hard on what happened or you're going, hey, we played really well, but then I watch the film and go, wow, sometimes we just made plays that weren't out of good things that we did. And that it's such an imperfect game that it obviously causes that internal struggle all the time. There's no question. And, and I think that's also why a lot of times you're much better off evaluating the film when the uh, emotion has calmed down a little bit. As a head coach for me, I think I always did a better job with the film the next day than I did right after the game. Sometimes on back-to-back games, you're doing it right after the game. And the result would filter into how I looked at the film. Whereas if I did it the next morning, I could objectively evaluate it like you're saying and say, you know what? We actually played well offensively. I didn't think we did during the game, but we played well offensively. We simply didn't make shots or vice versa. You know, hey, I what needs it. But we just made a lot of tough shots. Our execution was poor. Our passing wasn't good. Our screening wasn't good. Our shot making got us through. You have to be able to evaluate objectively to know what needs improvement. If you're always focused on the result, I think your team is going to be very up and down because you're going to really go to work after you lose on correcting things. And you're going to let a lot of things slide when you win. And so sustained excellence becomes very, very difficult. Yeah, again, so many great shares here, Coach. Thanks so much. I mean, fantastic knowledge for coaches to uh, stimulate their coaching. And I so appreciate you taking time. Obviously, we could go on and on and on with all these scenarios because you're you're so knowledgeable and you've thought so deeply about things. But I just want to thank you for taking the time uh, to be able to share with our coaches and to stimulate their thinking. And I don't know if you have a last thought to leave them with, but we look forward to our coaches and to stimulate their thinking. And I don't know if you have a last thought to leave them with, but we look forward to watching you in the future, wherever you're coaching or wherever you're talking about basketball. Well, thank you very much. And yeah, I would just say to everyone that it's a great profession and what you've done in the past uh, year or so here to watching other coaches work in practice is the greatest teaching experience there is. And I would say to any coach, any chance they get to watch other teams practice, to watch other team, other coaches work is the way that they're going to learn. And then in this profession, we all need to support each other because there's no one outside of coaching that understands what this is all about. They think they do, but they don't. And so if we don't support each other, it makes the job even more difficult. Maybe that opens up a whole new conversation, but isn't it surprising how little camaraderie there is sometimes amongst coaches? And I don't know what the NBA seems to have changed a lot over the years. And maybe it's that we're not in situations to hang out. But that is such an excellent point about how we can share together. And there's a coach, actually, a collegiate coach, that said that he invites every coach that comes to their gym to play them over for dinner the night before. And he said, say, there's, you know, 15 home games in the year. He said only three coaches took him up on the offer. (laughs) <laughs> which you know whether that's the right thing or not it's just really true that it's like it's me against you mentality right no and, and i think that look where, whether for some people it just may be the timing of it in the season uh, of but, but i do think that having support system of other coaches however you go about it and not necessarily just other basketball coaches i mean i have learned a lot from coaches in every sport because we're handling a lot of the same situations in communication with players, best methods of teaching, managing work and rest, practice organization, all a lot of outside criticism of people who think they know how we should do our jobs, but they don't understand what coaching is really about. And, and I think both for support and for learning, you've got to have relationships with other coaches. And then I think little things like just supporting coaches, I really bristle when I read of coaches that that say things critical of other coaches. You know, I that and, and you don't see it a lot, but when I see it, it bothers me. We've got enough people out there uh, criticizing, and I think it's pretty easy to put in a good word for an opponent. You know, if you had a great game, even let's say offensively, you know, to say something like, 
you know, well, we knew we would really have to execute well offensively tonight because, you know, Joe's always got good defensive teams. I mean, anything like that that supports a coach with anything like that that supports a coach with his own parents, fan base, media, things like that, I, I think goes a long way. And, and it's something that people, you know, all of us could do a little bit better job of supporting the other guy. And I think, you know, after losses, we'll get so caught up in all of the things, you know, we did poorly, where you can at least throw in a little bit on, hey, look, I mean, I didn't think we played that badly. Uh, Tom really had his team ready to go tonight. And I thought that their defensive schemes against us were outstanding. You know, just things like that, that where we can throw positive words at other coaches. And I'm not talking about making stuff up or lying. There's got to be something that those guys do that the guy on the other bench does that you think he does a good job of. It's just, it's just highlighting things. It's still being honest. It's just a way to highlight the other guy and whether you won or lost the game, but good. I think those things are important in this profession. So true here, here and uh, honor the game and honor your opponent. And that's a part of this process. So coach, again, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to connecting you somewhere down the line. Okay. Thank you very much. To find out more about Coach and all we spoke about today, 